35 Nissan GTR owes its lineage to the GTRs that came before it. The R32, the R33, and R34 all had a role in shaping this car. But when production of the R34 ended, it wasn't until 2008 that the world saw its successor. And what a successor the R35 has been. But how does the porky 4,000 pound R35 compare to the 3,400 pound R34? My road test review is coming up right after the break. Confession, I hate cleaning my own cars. That's why I love Adams polishes. Whatever you want to clean, polish, or shine, Adams has a specific product just for that, even for matte finishes. Since 2000, Adams Polishes has been offering premium car care products dedicated to the enthusiast. Whether you're a professional detailer or a weekend warrior, their innovative and effective products will enable you to achieve amazing results on your prized possession. Adams, made with pride and passion in the USA. Years ago, I was lucky enough to realize one of my dreams. I bought my first GTR. I had been Japanese car fan since the 1970s and owning a Skyline GTR was the culmination of my quest to own the ultimate JDM vehicle. I had that car for about two years and I put about 6,000 miles on the clock during that time. And I also got a chance to ring it out at a couple of track days. Today I own a 2015 GTR that I purchased new back in 2014. So I wanted to do a long term road test between these two cars. And when my friend 458 Destroyer loaned me his R34 for the summer, I had the chance to do exactly that. Let's start with the R34. Of course, the R34 needs no introduction. If you're watching my channel, you know all about this car. Like its predecessors, the R34 uses the tried and true RB26. Rated at about 280 horsepower from the factory, it's been proven that these engines were underrated and that they really made closer to about 330 horsepower at the wheels. For its time, the R34 is a Tesla system coupled with the Hikus four-wheel steering system was the pinnacle of sports car technology. In fact, one could argue that the R34 was more advanced than any Ferrari or Lamborghini of that time period. And for proof of that, you can look at the lap times of competitors' cars like the 1999 Diablo, which did the Nürburgring in about eight minutes and four seconds of memory serves. And the R34 GTR did it in seven minutes and 49 seconds. That's pretty quick, right? So how quick really is the R34? Stock, the car gets to 60 miles an hour in just under five seconds, and it covers the quarter mile in around 13.5 seconds, depending on which journalist you believe. My modified Blackbird was a little bit faster and it was clocked by Road and Track magazine, so it fared a little better. It did zero to 60 in 3.9 seconds and covered the quarter mile in about 12.2 seconds. So if you're coming into an R34 from a 1990s Nissan, Honda, or something like that, the R34 feels legitimately quick. But if you're jumping into an R34 after owning or driving any car making 400 horsepower from say 2007 or on, the R34 will probably feel adequate, but probably not amazing. Time has moved on, right? For its time though, it was highly competitive. Compared to the R35, it would get taken to Gapplebee's. It would just get left. So it's no surprise there. After all, a 2017 Z01 Camaro will run circles around a 1997 Camaro, right? And of course, with Nissan's Hikus four-wheel steering system, Owners either heaped praise upon it or disabled it just as quick as they got it. The truth is that most of us mere mortals are really in no position to give definitive opinions on the Hika system because few of us have anywhere near the racing experience to give a meaningful appraisal of the system. So I'm gonna avoid that. I just, I will just state that I took my system off. Inside the R34, the cool MFD or multifunction display was advanced for its time and was something that really made this generation of the GTR very special. It was like being in a video game. Today, it seems almost ancient compared to today's standards, but in 1999, it was the cutting edge, and it's one of the things that R34 owners love most about this car. Slide behind the wheel of an R34, and you are taken back in time to when games like Gran Turismo attracted car fans of all ages, even old guys like me. Honestly, you, you get in the car, the nostalgia hits you instantly. Suddenly, you're a teenager all over again. Only the symphony that you hear from under the hood reminds you that this is not a video game and it's real life. No digitized, synthesized sound files, just authentic guttural sounds sung by the RB26. No video game ever got those sounds just right. And of course, the sweet sound of HKS super sequential blow off valves is something you have to hear at least once in your life. There's no other experience like it. What does it sound like? It sounds like 1999, baby. A time when you didn't have to get cavity searched every time you went to the airport and no one needed a safe space because of a tweet. Good times. 
from the moment the RB26 comes to life, you feel yourself turning the hands of time back to a time when all was right with the world, gas was cheaper, everybody knew what gender they were, and Supras and Skylines were relatively affordable. Oh, the good old days. So driving the R34 is everything you would expect it to be. It's about the noise, it's about the smells, it's about the visceral experience of driving your childhood hero. This is the car that you grew up wanting. And when you finally get behind the wheel, it is everything you wanted it to be. It's fast, it's smooth, it's fun to drive, it gets looks, it's manual transmission, none of that DCT and it sounds so good. Yes, so it has a few rattles, so it's not very refined, okay, but it's kind of the same thing that you would say if you were dating a stripper. Lots of satisfaction, but maybe lacking a little bit of refinement. Okay, I can live with that. And it doesn't have all the stuff that you expect from a car for this price range. Backup camera, cruise control, heated seats, air-conditioned seats, but what it does come with is this. How much would you pay for that? How much? All of it, right? This is why you buy an R34 GTR. The R34 brings a more emotional, a more personal experience. It's a samurai warrior, a precision instrument, and in the hands of an expert, it can do amazing things, or it could kill you. Interior-wise, though, the R34 is no Porsche. The GTR's materials are focused on durability, not luxury. You won't find double-stitch upholstery, and there's not even a hint of Alcantara or leather anywhere. But that's not what this car is about. It's as if Nissan engineers that those creature comforts had no place in a car purpose-built for purists. Although I'm a little confused as to why these cars came with ashtrays. Oh yeah, everybody in Japan smokes, or did, at least back then. The materials, the switch gear, and the technology seem instantly familiar and easy to use. Maybe it's because we've been playing them in video games. Maybe because a lot of us have been mid-90s Datsuns before, Nissans before, right? When driving an R34 at moderate speeds, it drives pretty much like any number of mid to late 90s Nissan cars. Probably the closest thing would be an S14 with coilovers. I had one of those for a while. It feels very similar. But with the Olin's coilovers on this GTR, the ride is super stiff, like really stiff. So stiff that Every pavement transition reminds you that this car should not be your first choice for cross-country trips. It's just too bouncy. The upside is that you feel every bit of the road if you like that sort of thing. If you run over a condom, you'll be able to tell if it's been used or not. Given that this car is 22 years old, it has a few more rattles than my R34 did back in 2001, which was two years old, which is understandable. But when compared to an R35 GTR, this car rides like a skateboard and the R35 rides like a Cadillac. Again, this car is 22 years old, my R35 is only seven years old. But the R34's handling is sharp, without a doubt. There's no drama and it feels sure-footed. The stock brakes are more than adequate for most applications, but you'll want to have upgraded pads, lines, and rotors for serious track duty. Still, it's capable right out of the box. There are a few quirks about the R34 if you're driving one in a country where they drive on the right-hand side of the road like we do here in the United States of America. If you live in a country like the USA, you're going to find the turn indicator stock on the wrong side of the steering wheel. It's on this side in the R34, it's on this side in America, right? You'll also find yourself looking in the wrong place when you check your mirrors. When I'm driving along and I look in my rear view mirror of my R35, I'm looking over here for the R34, it's over there. Your muscle memory and instincts after decades of driving on the left side of the car are distracting at first to say the least, but you'll pick it up after a few sessions, but switching between cars each day gets a little complicated. Left-hand turn lanes are also problematic because you can't see beyond the left, the opposing left-hand turn. If you're sitting here, I can't see the cars over here because I'm sitting on the wrong side of the car. But none of these shortcomings or idiosyncrasies gave me even a moment of pause when I bought my R34 GTR 20 years ago. These are just things you have to accept. As a weekend driver and show car, it was exactly what I wanted at that time. 
could drive it fast and have some fun, but take it to car shows. I paid $78,000 for that car back then. To put that in perspective, $78,000 would be $91,000 in today's dollars here in 2021. To put it in more perspective, back in 2001, $78,000 was almost double the price of a Corvette. And the 2002 Porsche Turbo could be had for $115,000. I had good times with my R34, but I wanted to move up market, so I sold that car in 2003. In the years that followed, I owned two different Lamborghini Diablos, a 98 SV and an 01 VT, as well as a 2003 996 Turbo, an E46 M3, a 1000 horsepower Supra, an SL600 Mercedes, and a B7 Audi RS4, to name a few. In February of 2014, I purchased this R35 GTR. And to date, it's been the best car I've ever owned, bar none. Before buying that car though, I looked at a large assortment of cars before I settled on that car. For the money, it was the best car on the road performance wide. Here in 2021, having now owned my GTR for the better part of seven years, I've had plenty of opportunity to formulate opinions on this car. It's done track days, I've been commuted in the car, and I've driven it daily. The R35 is an R34 in steroids. The 3.8 liter V6 doesn't sound anywhere near as good as the RB26, but it's 545 base horsepower and super fast DCT transmission and zero to 60 times in 2.8 seconds have me saying, so what? I don't care that it's not an R34. The R35 takes advantage of two decades of evolution and improvements in Nissan's Atezza ETS system. Atezza stands for Advanced Total Traction Engineering System for All Terrain with Electronic Torque Split. That's a mouthful, Japanese guys. During a standing start, the system sends only 2% of the available torque to the front wheels and 98% to the rear, essentially making the GTR a rear drive car. Thanks to the number of sensors, specially developed clutches, and maybe a bit of UFO technology, <laughs> Nissan has been able to create a system that can split torque from front to rear in milliseconds up to a maximum of 50-50 split and it is all done automatically and instantaneously. This is the system that has helped the R35 GTR reign as the king of the zero to 60 times for about a decade. To this day, the R35 GTR is still faster to 60 miles per hour than cars costing two to five times the price. Basically, the R35 is a Jekyll and Hyde experience. Put it in drive and it's a freeway cruiser, it's a grocery getter, it's a commuter, it does all of those things. Switch the transmission to manual and you're ready for canyon carving. Change the suspension settings and maybe add a set of sticky tires and you're all set for a high performance track day event. When you do the full bolt-ons to these cars, to include downpipes, an exhaust system, a set of bigger fuel injectors, fuel pump upgrades, E85 and a tune, you're adding about 120 horsepower, so you're taking the 545 horsepower up to about 625 to 650 at the wheels. Despite this, it still pulls 24 miles per gallon on the highway. Nobody cares about EMPG in these cars, I know that, but I just mentioned it for those who were curious. Driving the R35 is a no fuss affair. You, you hop in using your keyless entry and you push a button. These cars start up every time and on the first try. The R35's DCT gearbox is smoother and shifts way faster than the R34 by a long shot, but it's nowhere near as good as say a modern Porsche PDK or the more recent crop of DCDs available in cars like the new Ford GTs, Ferraris, and the Lamborghinis. It's still great, but it's just not as good as those, but it's certainly better than the R34. All right, let's talk R35. Now, driving them back to back as I have done for the past few weeks, there are some serious differences between the cars. Now, I'm not comparing a brand new R35 GTR to a 20-year-old Nissan R34 GTR. This car is now seven years old. I bought it as a 2015 model on Valentine's Day of 2014, so it has seen some miles. I've got over 50,000 miles on the car. It's pretty much been my daily driver for the last seven years, although we have another car in the house. This is the car I've been driving all that time. Out of the 40 cars that I've owned in my life, this is by far my favorite car that I've ever owned and I've ever driven, with the possible exception of a McLaren. That being said, there are some distinct similarities between the R35 and the R34. You have an MFD, a multifunction display. Now, obviously, the car being 20 years newer, this is designed by Polyphony, which is the company that did Sony PlayStation's graphics, right? I believe that was what it was. But there's a lot of refinements that come with this car. This car has a backup camera. This, all those silly accoutrements that you find in modern cars, whether they're GT cars or even sports cars. Maybe not in that Porsche GT3, but Corvettes, Ferraris, that kind of stuff, all the kind of stuff that you would want to have. And that's great. However, it feels like it has lost some of that 
visceral experience. You're not rowing gears in this car. It's a DCT transmission, which is quick to respond and makes the car faster, but you're not rowing gears. There's no heel and toe. All that stuff is gone. But what it is, is a goddamn beast. thing's got the beans and I supply the rice. 655 horsepower at the wheels, all-wheel drive on E85. This is nothing special in the R35 GTR world. A lot of people are driving these cars making 900 horsepower and they're driving them daily. That's what makes this car great. Yes, a lot of people say the car can drive itself, right? I've heard that nonsense. I defy you to do this. Go out to it any racetrack and turn all the traction controls off and tell me that the car drives itself. You'll, after the first spin, you're going to realize that hey, you actually need some talent to drive the car. But still, it's a lot easier to drive than an R34. So does that make it better, or does it make it more livable, or does it make it worse? That depends. Right? It's got cruise control. You've got three suspension settings. You have normal, soft, or race. It gets very stiff. If you're driving the car for a long time, you'll feel the difference. You as a passenger is getting in the car, probably wouldn't feel it right away, but as soon as I put it to soft, you can see it gets softer. So, which one is better, the R34 or the R35? It depends. Do you like a more masculine experience, a more hands-on driver's experience, then the R34 is your car. If you want a car that anybody can drive fast, and you just don't want to be bothered with having to live with the idiosyncrasies, or the noises, or the smells, then you're gonna buy an R35. It's not the same experience as an R34, but it depends on what you want. Do you want it soft or you don't want it hard? I'm sure your wife has something to say about that. <laughs> DCTs are better than conventional manual gearboxes in every performance measurement. The computer controls the gearbox and it's shifting far better than any human can, and that translates into quicker quarter mile times, quicker zero to 60 times. DCT transmissions are now the only transmission offering in nearly every supercar in the world today. No human can shift as fast as one of these transmissions, but there is a lot to be said about the fun factor that can only come from a true manual gearbox, and a lot of people say that. I get it, and if that's your jam, what can I tell you? But the 0 to 60 times are not the only reason the R35 is light years ahead of the R34. The R35 now has become a gentleman's sports car for better or worse, but it still manages to have a touch of boy racer. It depends on how much you modify your R35, but a 650 wheel horsepower R35 is perfectly suitable for commuting, long road trips, and even Costco pickups. Yes, it weighs almost 600 pounds more than the R34, but it is better in every performance measurement category by a wide margin. It has many of the creature comforts you'd expect on a car like a Lexus and the ability to still run lap times that are competitive or superior to rivals costing many times its cost at track days. So there's a lot to be said for the dual purpose rolls, right? There are no rattles on this car, no squeaks, no leaks, and everything works. My R35 is seven years old, so it's no spring chicken, and it currently has about 50,000 miles on the clock, and it's still as tight as a frog's butthole. The R35's interior, though, still lacks the sophistication of upmarket rivals, but it also lacks the steeper sticker price of its competitors. Despite all this, it's still noticeably smoother, quieter, and offers a much smoother ride than the R34. The transmission offers multiple options, as does the traction control system. So there are a lot of options to tune it the way you want, just by throwing a switch. In summary, the R35 is a modern rendition of the R34 GTR, holistically refined, tweaked, and polished to a whole new level. In my opinion, it's the natural evolution of the R34, forged during two decades of experimentation, development, and refinement. Of course, Pyrrhus will argue that the R34 is a more visceral driving experience than the R35, and frankly, they'd be right. But you have to manhandle an R34 to turn great lap times. It's a lot of work to do it. Watch the old options videos. In an R35, changes of direction or speed are achieved effortlessly, which means that this car can turn much faster lap times than its predecessor with much less effort. Acceleration in an R35 is instantaneous and merciless. It should be given that its engine is considerably larger than the R34 and makes double the horsepower, so no surprise there. 
but it's a fact. Despite the performance data, there are those who will not be satisfied until they own an R34, no matter how much it costs. And I get it. I understand it. You want to own your dream. Certainly, every car enthusiast knows that there are better cars for the money. That's not the issue. It's not the money for some people. Therefore, though, buying an R34 has to be an emotional decision. There's no defendable logic to such a purchase otherwise. It has to be about the emotions. So does the R34 live up to the hype? In a word, yeah. It really does. So what it really comes down to is what price would you pay to live your dream? How much can you afford? As of this writing, even black market bootleg R34 GTRs are selling for well over $150,000 in the USA. These cars are not legal here yet. So you can't get a legal R34 on US roads until 2024. By then, clean, low mile examples will be well over $200,000. At that point, you would be able to buy two R35s for the price of a used R34 or any number of other cars that are superior to the R34. So again, ultimately it comes down to which part of your anatomy is making your purchasing decision. Is it your brain or is it your heart? That's it for this episode, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe so that you can get notified when new episodes drop. And don't forget to check out the video description down below so you can cash in on coupon codes for products and services from my sponsors. We'll see you next time.